on Nationwide this evening, we're in the northwest to visit Donegal, Derry and Sligo, where the links to St. Colm Kill have been remembered in recent months. We hear about the man and his life's work. Plus, in Sligo, we hear about the publication of the Book of Sligo, which, it's planned, will be delivered to every house in the county over the coming months. Hello, you're welcome to Nationwide. This evening we're in Sligo and Donegal for stories of the histories of the peoples who have lived in the Northwest for hundreds of years. The people who lived in this landscape have left their indelible mark in stone and ink for us to admire. Columkill or St Columba is regarded as one of the three patron saints of Ireland, along with St Patrick and St Bridget. Columkill was born in Garton in Donegal in December 521. He is also the patron saint of Derry, Osgoelga Dira Columkilla, and he was a significant historical figure in the spread of Christianity in Britain. Mary Hart has been finding out how the people of Donegal and Derry are commemorating the 1,500th birthday of this influential Irish monk. Little has altered of this landscape in northwest Donegal since 521, when a child was born at the foot of the Derry Vey Mountains, and whose influence will still be felt here a millennium and a half later. In the Middle Ages, Christian pilgrims flocked from across Europe to the many shrines associated with Columkill, Dove of the Church in Gaelic or Columba in Latin. Today, people continue to seek his intercession. There are many legends and cures attached to the saint. Dr. Brian Lacey has authored a book on the life of Columkill and is a leading authority on the lore of the saint. There were no birth certificates in the 6th century, so the records we have are quite late. But all the logic, the historical logic, all points to this general area as being the place where he was born. The area where we're in here is called Garton, Garthon in Irish Garton in English, which seems to me to mean the same thing or be the same thing as the meaning of the English word garden, because it is a kind of a green jewel of a garden. All the land around us is all mountainous, rough, bog land, and then you come down into this beautiful little green valley where there are three lakes, and that's garden. And all around this area where we are now, the, the, the fields are full of stories and monuments connected with the birth of Columkill. Of course, everything in Ireland is always a split, and we have a split also in the terms of where Columkill was born. Down the hill, there's um, another place called Lach na Cui, and the, the, the so official signposts all direct you to there, that that's the birthplace. We're inside a little church, which was certainly, almost certainly built in the 16th century by a great Donegal leader called Manus O'Donnell. And Manus wrote a, also wrote a great life about of Colum Killock. And so this church was built in the 16th century on what people then thought was the birthplace. And I agree fully with the man, as these other people, that actually this is the site of his birthplace. His most important monastery was in Iona, a little island off the coast of Scotland. And from there, a whole network of churches and monasteries spreads out, not only in, in, in Scotland, the north of England, and of course throughout Ireland. In Donegal, one of the most celebrated relics associated with Columkill is the chalky Garton clay that's secreted in people's pockets for luck or carried across the world in luggage to ensure a safe journey used for all sorts of purposes. In medieval times, people, women put it on their tongue to help them during labour, but it's used in all sorts of things. Now, fo Donegal footballers allegedly put it in their boots, both soccer and Gaelic, and brings them uh, success or otherwise, and it's used for a, 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 you know, multiplicity of, of purposes and cures and, and help in all sorts of ways. I normally carry bits of it myself. Throughout this year, commemorations have been taking place in Donegal, in Derry and in Scotland. The Slee Column Kill, a Camino-inspired walk, crisscrosses places in Donegal associated with the saint. 
Modern day pilgrims have been retracing the paths taken by pilgrims over a thousand years. I have had a great love for walking the Camino in Spain and a couple of years ago looking at 2021 and the 1500th anniversary of Colum Kill, um, I said, and a few of us began to say to one another, we have the makings of a real Camino here in Donegal, linking all the places that uh, have resonances of St. Colum Kill. Today's our sixth day. We started in Glen Colum Kill and walked out across the most beautiful scenery across the mountain and you know just the beauty about walking through Donegal is there's something different every corner you turn there is a sense of column kill in the air in so many of the places we have been in. All kinds of interesting people came out uh, we walked part of the way with Daniel and Magello O'Donnell and that was great fun there's been a lot of lovely experiences my dream is that this will be really established. There is a good two weeks walking uh, between Glen Column Kill and Derry and into Inishowen and sh uh, end ending at Shrove. And uh, I could see hundreds, indeed thousands of people coming and having a wonderful uh, experience in mind, body and spirit uh, walking the Schlee Column Kill. The kindness of strangers has been apparent to us in every village and roadway that people have been coming out waving at us, beeping the horns, um, stopping to speak, invite us in for a cup of tea, bring us out water. I feel privileged to be walking in the footsteps of Colum Kill, to experience the joy of the companionship along the way. Um, and apart from the group, the wonderful group that we're with, meeting people uh, here and there, making connections with them, having tea with them, having the chat. Various stopping points along the Slee are linked to the story of Columkill. Today it's Rye Church near Falcara, where it's said is the oldest and tallest Celtic cross on these islands. It's 21 feet high and 7 feet wide and it's very similar to St John's Cross in Iona where Colum Killa had gone to eventually. It's very, very much part of our symbol of our parish. It's very much part of the whole history and folklore of the area. But again, it ties into Colum Killa and there's so much folklore here with Colum Killa. Uh, we have numerous artefacts uh, and we're very proud of that tradition and he's still very much alive. Columkill or Columba is credited with founding a monastery in Derry and the city has claimed him as its patron saint, Dura Columkill. This year sees a cross-border collaboration between Derry and Straban Council and Donegal County Council, jointly hosting commemorative events. We're delivering a, a programme of events so that the two councils have got quite a number of exhibitions and commissions and events, but we're working with partners locally, regionally, nationally and internationally. Yeah, Derry would consider St Colm Killer Columba to be its patron saint, so you can see his name in quite a few places. So there's um, St Columba's Long Tower Church, um, there's also St Colm's Cathedral, um, and there's also St Colm's Park um, itself, quite an iconic um, park in Derry. We have an ex exhibition in the Tower Museum at the minute, um, and what you'll find there is panels I'm telling you the story about Colum Kill's association with the various sites in Donegal and, and Derry. Um, so it's entitled Colum Kill Man and Myths and it recognises that I suppose 15 year, 100 years after Colum Kill was born, um, there's a lot of stories, some are myths and some are truths. So the exhibition is trying to look at you know, what, what's fact and what's fiction, I suppose, and have a little bit of fun with that. The exhibition will move from Derry to Donegal County Museum and run until February next. There's no doubt that the influence of Colum Kill and Columba is still strongly felt in his homelands, a millennium and a half after his birth. Fascinating story of the history of Colum Kill and his association with County Donegal. We are in the neighbouring county of Sligo and after the break we'll be finding out about the huge community effort that went into the production of the Book of Sligo, a copy of which is destined for each household in the county. See you shortly. Welcome back to Nationwide, County Sligo, Yates County, with the imposing Ben Bulban, 
the megalithic tombs of Carrow Keel and Carrow Moor, and the raw power of the surf at Strand Hill. There's a lot for the people of Sligo to be proud of. And now a new publication called The Book of Sligo aims to draw attention to the lesser known gems from within all 40 parishes in the county. It's the brainchild of the Blue Raincoat Theatre Company who were looking for a lockdown project like no other. What we're trying to achieve is a community celebration of County Sligo. The particular uh, springboard for this was that it's the um, 1,500 years since the birth of St. Colin Kill, who's nothing at all got to do with Sligo, except that he came here and the Battle of the Books was fought here out uh, on Drumcliff River to the north of, the, uh, of where we're standing here. Colin Kill went and copied a book from St. Finian and uh, St. Finian took umbrage at it and local chieftains got involved and there was a huge battle and there was lots of people killed. So we're not really celebrating that, um, but what we are doing is we took that idea of the book to create this, uh, this project. So we're going to take a journey around some of the stories contained within the book. And we're starting with the Carrowkeel Cairn Complex, consisting of 26 monuments dotting the landscape. 5,000 years ago, the people who lived in this area built these monumental passage tombs marked with loose stones on top. Often you'd see art on the rocks within these monuments, like at Newgrange. But there's been no rock art discovered at Carrowkeel. Until now. We're going to be among the first people to see it in thousands of years. But first, there's the small matter of a near vertical climb. And for some reason, I'm carrying a blackboard. Archaeologist Robert Henzi rediscovered the art and is bringing me up to see it at Cairn B. Nearly there now, Anne. OK, great. Yeah. Under the mound of rocks is a lintel and a tiny entrance to a chamber. So we've yeah. got to go into that little entrance. Now, you ring the doorbell. <laughs> OK, I'll follow you. Right. Even though it's small, this, I suppose, is the Sistine Chapel of Karakil yeah. <laughs> and this tiny little piece of art. But it's, you know, one of only two examples in this monument that have been found and the only art known from Karakil. And so it's very subtle, um, but it's certainly there. You can see two little spirals left and right. And beneath that, a little kind of zigzag form as well. Another one further down the stone. Uh, one of the things it does is it connects us to all of these other monuments at Loch Crewe and the Boyne Valley and also nearby here at Carramore, all of these other major passage tomb complexes which have examples of this carved art in the construction stones of tombs. And it was yourself who made the discovery and I'm conscious that I'm in a very privileged position of being one of a very few number of people who've been in to see this. Yeah, and I suppose you're part of a small club now, Anne, and, um, and that, that's part of the joy, really, of archaeology or of all kinds of research, that you can be very fortunate to be one of the first few people to see the art. Well, this is uh, fantastic to be able to be in here to see it. Robert has also penned a paragraph about the Book of Ballymote, written in the 14th century and now under the care of the Royal Irish Academy. The Book of Ballymote also features in our Book of Sligo. Yes, and it's a lovely connection. You know, we're only a stone's throw away from, from Ballymote here. We wanted to highlight parts of Sligo history and heritage that were significant, that spoke to people that live in the county here today. And the Book of Ballymote is one of those treasures. So that had to be uh, featured as much as the art here at Carrickale. Within the manuscript is the key to an ancient written Irish language called Ohm. It's a series of lines usually carved into a rock and spells out significant messages. You know, you look at many modern books, they fall apart very quickly. And we have this book here from the 14th century, still with us today. And the word manuscript, it comes from the word for hand and writing. So this was hands, lots of hands, real people back in the 14th century writing this book. Now, this is where the blackboard comes in handy. Do you know what, Robert? I have a little bit of a challenge for you and for myself to test out our 
ohm writing skills. So maybe we'll try and spell out the word nationwide. I have my chalk and my trusty blackboard with me. So maybe you might be my guide. Are you well, very, very good, yes. As a, as a prehistorian, you're probably <laughs> going to be my guide. Um, but yeah, we'll start with a central line. OK, right. So all the way from the bottom up to the top. Mm-hmm. Radio. And we have to begin with an N. So we're going to do five uh, little um, dashes to the right-hand side of the line there. OK. And then yeah. an A. OK. So one line across, crossing that spine. OK. Perfect. Yeah. And then we're on to T. OK. So just this time we're going to the left of the line, three lines to the left. Yay. And of course, you need to remember this wouldn't have been full books written like this. This would have been on pillar stones at significant places in the landscape around mm. the country, using uh, the the corner of the stone, if you like, as a crossing point very often. So, do they have a W? You know. Well, now that's a problem. I think we're going to have a go at a V. Okay. If that's okay with you. So, three dashes to the right hand side. Okay. So, one, two, three. And then we have a new letter, D, so this is an easy one. Just two to the left-hand side. Lovely. Two of the long ones. Then yeah. our final letter, give me an E, please, Anne. This OK. <laughs> so I'm Carol here, am I? I'm you're, Carol Borderman. You're Carol Borderman. <laughs> and so we have four crossing the axis, and okay. we're right at the top of our word now at the moment. Nationwide. There we are. And remember where you saw it first. The Book of Ballymote gave us the key to the Ohm language, and that's made all the difference in keeping this ancient form of writing still understandable today. Well, we're going down to Sligo Town now to meet the man who pulled all these stories together for the Book of Sligo, Sean Golden. We wanted to be sure we didn't just repeat what everybody already knows about Sligo. And at one point, uh, somebody said, you know, this is like a book of marvels. So that became our, our guideline. We wanted to put together a book of marvels that people would be surprised what they found in it, and it would be a, a variety. Hiya. Hello there. Good evening. Uh, my name is John, and yes. I'm a volunteer with the Book of Sligo Community Arts Project. Do you hear about the I project? I have, actually. Excellent. Uh, well... A neighbour was going to hand deliver a copy of this book to a neighbour and be able to say, you know, just down the road there's this thing that you can find in the book. And that meant that we had to be aware of what would be interesting to people. So human interest was also an important part of it. Thank you so, so much. Like to hand over some parishes had a lot of material immediately available, and some of them it took us a while to track things down. So we began reaching out to other neighbours. Our next stop takes us out to Strand Hill. While the beach is beautiful, it can also be treacherous. And another story told in the Book of Sligo is of a daring rescue in 1947 of a family who took a picnic on what they thought was the beach, but was actually a sandbank. Kathleen Devins was 14 at the time and saw it all unfold. Two gentlemen and, was it four ladies and two children? And they went to Ross's Point, which is over that side. And then the men said, well, we'd like a couple of pints later on. So we lead the women and the children off in Strand Hill. So they came here and the bank would be about halfway between here and the corner. But they thought it was the beach. So they let everybody off. They sat where they were because it was a lovely, the 16th of August, 1947. And uh, they decided they'd have another picnic before they go home. And uh, they set up everything and stayed a bit too long. And they packed up and started for home. But the sea was very deep between, the, it had surrounded the bank, so they couldn't get in. So two of the ladies were fairly tallish and they took a chance on it. And the two ladies walked through the water. It was very high. And the ballroom was a couple of doors up, so there was a dance on. The alarm was raised in the dance hall and everybody came, but they got this man who was a wonderful swimmer. So he had to get a rope. So he put the rope around him. And the only one that would hold it, there was a couple of hundred maybe around by this time. The only one that had hold it was his wife. So his wife held the end of it and he went off out. And the first he brought in was a, a child and he strapped it to his back, but it was brought in safe and he went out 
six more times and they all got in safe. But by this time it got pretty dark, so only for she had the rope, he wouldn't even know where to come. Extraordinary so she, tale of rescue, wasn't it? It was, it was. It was great that they were all saved. And isn't it great that such a story that had a happy outcome yes. in an area where I'm sure you've had your share of tragedy has yes. made its way into yes. the Book of Sligo? There's so many sad stories. It's, it was a happy one. Another story featured in the Book of Sligo is St Attractor's Well. Now, a few years ago, Niall Martin visited St Attractor's Well with the former Bishop of Aconry, Brendan Kelly, who brought a group of newly arrived Syrian refugees to the well on St Attractor's feast day, August the 11th. Most of the Syrians who arrived in Ireland had little idea of what to expect, so we decided to give them an orientation of some of Ireland's heritage and history. Bishop Brendan Kelly is bringing us to see St. Attract as well on her feast day, August 11th. If Ireland is known as the Isle of Saints and Scholars internationally, then this is the echo of our saintly past. The Holy Well was a place of devotion. <laughs> where people came, they came to pray and sometimes they left offerings like the rosary beads over there and the beads over there and the little piece of cloth which is something of themselves which they leave there. What's interesting about St. Attracta is that she opened a hostel for travellers at a ford in a river at nearby Kilaret in the 5th century. Her reputation is of a woman who loved to be hospitable and to welcome people and to give them shelter if they on the road and also to give them refuge. The, the reputation of this well is that it's a place where a woman would come if she wanted to have a baby. So uh, it's one of the stories anyway that's told and uh, she would come to the well here and she would take one of these stones, these round stones, you see them? Yeah. And after she had the baby, she would bring the stone back. The well is maintained by the local community and it's said the waters here have restorative powers. I think it's a bit brown like all the water around here. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, local people still draw water here in bottles to bring to family members who are sick. Anybody else like to take a drink of water? You see, we bless ourselves as well. St. Attractor's Well is just one of the places featured in the Book of Sligo. The publication of the book is a major achievement for all involved. The book is being delivered to households free and is designed to bring communities together through the exploration of local places, local history and lore. What a wonderful community project and every household in the county will have a copy of the Book of Sligo for their Christmas reading. And so we've come to the end of this evening's Nationwide. Thanks indeed for watching from all of us on the team. Bye bye.